few weeks ago uh, when Scott told me, Pastor Scott sat down and said, hey, listen, uh, Pastor Jeremy and I are both going to be gone here in a few weeks. Uh, would you consider taking the, the messages that, that Sunday? So I said, well, I'll consider it. You know, it's not, I don't feel like it's my wheelhouse, but, um, but we had already been talking about different things and different teaching, things that we wanted to, to try to do. Uh, so I said, well, okay, well, what would you like me to talk about? And he said, well, just talk about worship. And so my initial thought was, you've got to be kidding me. That's a huge topic. How could I talk about that in one sermon? <laughs> so, but then as we kept talking and I kept praying and talking to different people, um, I came to the conclusion that, yeah, you know what, I actually do know what I want to talk about. Um, and I know you're going to be shocked to hear this, but it, it's about singing and music. Um, but there's a reason for that. I do want to start, though, laying a quick foundation of worship in general, uh, so that we're all starting at the same place, building uh, together from there. Uh, so if you would, we're going to read from Psalm 96. Sorry if the type's a little small in there. I didn't realize it would show up so small. Um, but it's on the screen if you want, or you can just grab a Bible or your phone, whatever you need to do. Uh, so we're going to start from Psalm 96, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. So there's a lot in that psalm. And if I get to do a second Sunday with you in this capacity, maybe we'll go through that psalm and break it down some. Because I'm not doing that with it today. I'm just using it in one lump chunk. Um, this psalm is all about God's kingship, God's authority, God's glory. It's all about him. Therefore, it's foundational, I believe, to Christian worship. That's our starting place. Um, so first and foremost, our goal each week, now some of you may not know this if you're not very close to anybody that's been in any sort of church leadership position, each and every week, there's always those discussions about the previous Sunday. Like, hey, how did things go? How do you think it went? Do you think this worked out well? Do you think it didn't? Um, so there's always some bit of trying to evaluate what we're doing. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, how do you evaluate what, what we're doing here? How do you evaluate spiritual growth? So one of the things that, that for me helps me know that we've done something successfully, <clears throat> is if when you leave here, if you've had just even a little bit deeper of a relationship with God, um, if your understanding of God is a little bit better, um, if your devotion to Him is a little bit more, if you're a little bit more showing that adoration and love for God that He is due, then I think it was successful. Um, so that being said, our personal experiences, while they're important, um, we can't let those experiences, whether they are struggles, um, whether they are victories, whatever they may be, we can't let those things take the first place. Uh, so first and foremost, he is the author and the main character of the story, not us. 
Uh, so when we get together and we are worshiping, it's about him, not about us. Um, now obviously, we are all part of that story, so there are parts when we are in there, but we're talking ground, foundational, ground-level things here. It's all about him first. Um, so, it's actually a pretty good point in, I think, the uh, When God is Most Important series that Pastor Scott's going through to talk about all this, because honestly, the whole idea of idolatry, that whole thing that we struggle with, putting other things in the place that God should only be, that's all a worship issue. Uh, when it comes down to it, it is all what are we worshiping, who are we worshiping. Um, he has created us and hardwired us as worshipers, and we do it without thinking about it. We just need to be more conscious about what we're doing. Uh, so I found this quote here uh, from John Calvin. We can, should consider it the great end of our existence to be found numbered among the worshipers of God. Have you ever thought about that when people are wondering, what's, what's the meaning of life? What am I here for? Well, that's a, a very good starting point for any believer. That's the reason we were created. We are to be worshipers. And then similarly, D.A. Carson, another theologian, he said, We cannot ascribe to the Lord all the glory due his name if we are consumed by self-love or intoxicated by pitiful visions of our own greatness or independence. Worship is not merely a formal ascription of praise to God. It emerges from my whole being to this whole God, and therefore it reflects not only my understanding of God, but my love for him. We're going to talk a little bit about that statement there, my whole being to this whole God in a little bit. Um, but based on what that, his statement there, have you ever thought about your worship being a reflection of your understanding of God and your love for him? Yeah, that could be a very sobering thought. It's basically that saying, people that watch you worship the Lord, they basically are evaluating your understanding and love for God based on your worship. And if it never has crossed your mind, it's pretty sobering to think about that many times something so important we don't give any thought to. But that's a good foundation. Now I want to kind of narrow the focus um, I want to talk more about what we do each week here. Uh, we gather together each week, and many people wonder why. Um, there's many, uh, many millennials, can I say that? Many times that's kind of like a bad word now. Many millennials, their mindset is, I don't, why do we even do this? Why? There's no point to it. So I want to start there, because there's something special about the gathering of the believers. And I get this uh, from a few different aspects of Scripture. First, the Holy Spirit resides in believers. And we see that uh, in different places throughout Scripture. I'm pulling out a couple here, John 14 and from Romans 8. Uh, 14, 16 through 17. I'm going to focus in on the end of 17. Uh, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then the end of chapter, or verse 11 from Romans 8, 9 through 11. Um, well, I'll read that whole verse, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So because of Jesus, there's a special working or amplification, so to speak, uh, of God's presence when believers gather. Um, basically what I'm saying there, if you're a hermit and you never are in the company of other believers worshiping together, you're not going to see God move the same ways that you would in a gathering of believers. That's just the way it works. Uh, we see that in Scripture. Um, not that God doesn't deal with us one-on-one, -on -one, but, but when multiple believers, all filled with the Holy Spirit, get together, God works and he does things that he wouldn't do if it was just us most of the time. So, I also reference here, let me, uh, let me flip back here real quick. I reference Matthew 18 and Hebrews 10. And again, just kind of pulling out little pieces of these verses. You can look them up later um, and get them more in context. I'll tell you right now, I have the tendency to pull out a bigger chunk of verses maybe than I need. But context is a big deal to me. 
I can't stand when people pull out one single line of a, a verse and try to stand on it and make it mean something because usually they're trying to make it mean something it doesn't. But So verse 20 from Matthew 18, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And Hebrews 10, uh, 21 through 25, I'll pick it up at verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So basically, it's very important for the followers of Christ to attend a church. You've got to be a part of a local body. We're instructed not to neglect meeting together. And now many may also not understand that and think, yeah, okay, there's, what's the point? Um, now there's also those that just feel like, hey, you just want our money. That's not it either. There's actual reasons and purposes behind this um, because of how we've been created by God. So we're going to shift into talking about those right now. Um, we're, you might have seen it already. I pulled up Psalm 22.3. Uh, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. So what does it mean to be enthroned? Uh, for us, we're going to generally say that enthroning is setting someone up in a position of authority, supreme support, importance and significance. That's all true. Uh, however, in this instance, this Hebrew, Hebrew word, uh, it's also translated and more times is translated um, in this context to mean to dwell or into inhabit. So again, it's the same idea that Matthew 18 is telling us, um, that basically we need to remember when we gather together, we're in a position where the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is in our presence. He's presiding over our gatherings. So understand that. He's here. Now. You know, we always think, you know, that day, someday in the future, I'm going to get to see him. Well, yes, we'll see him face to face. But we can't forget that he's here now, too. He wants to work now, and we can't ignore that. Um, and honestly, we and the gathered church is going to suffer if we do, if we ignore it. Um, and it's also common, I'll just touch on this, too, because uh, we're going to lead into some of this. It's common to misuse the word worship today. We've kind of made it a slang word. We use it for a lot of things that it's not intended for, um, you know, even advertising service times. Worship is at 8.15 and 10.45. Is it? So that's the only time we worship then, right? Like, is that what we're telling people? Like, no, that's not what we're saying, but that's what we've just kind of distilled it down to, or rather, maybe not distilled, but watered it down. Um, in Scripture, worship is always a verb. Um, there is always action associated with it. So it's also commonly taught that our times of, of singing, when we start off our services, and there's a reason we do it in that order, um, although we can change it up. Um, but it's also commonly, I've heard many, many preachers, um, I'm not bashing them at all, it's true, but um, say that the singing part is simply to, to prepare our hearts to hear the word of the Lord preached. Well, that's true, partially. I don't think it's completely accurate. And here's why. is because as worshipers, we have roles. And these are roles that are found in Scripture. Um, our first role is we minister to God. So that a lot of times our song portions, the singing that we do, first and foremost, that's our ministering back to God. You know, we'll get into that a little later. He, he sings to us, we'll sing back to him. Um, but in Deuteronomy 10.8, uh, that's one supporting scripture. Again, you can look up these if you want on your own. Um, but at the time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And here's, here's this first one, to stand before the Lord to minister to him. And then uh, 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. So there again, if you had never thought of yourself being a believer as being a priest, well then, great, you learned something today, because you are called a priest. Um, you are part of the royal priesthood now because you are a believer. And so our second role, which we can also find at the second half, 
uh, the ending part of that Deuteronomy 10, 8 verse, um, and to bless in his name to this day. Our second part is we minister and teach and edify each other. So Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, Colossians 3, 16, these are all very common uh, scriptures for people to know. Um, verse 19 in Ephesians 5, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Um, and Colossians 3.16, similarly, teaching and admonishing one, one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and thankfulness in your heart. Um, so, point is here, at this point, worshiping is participatory. Now, if you know anything about history, that hasn't always been the case in the church, especially medieval periods of the church. Most services were silent. Um, and that was also one of, the, one of the things that the Reformers took a huge issue with because it's not scriptural. It's not scriptural for spectatorship to happen in the church. We're not gathering to watch other people perform. Um, so if you think that's what we're doing here each week, then you're wrong and we'll talk about it later. But yes, you're intended to be engaged and involved here. So... These reformers, anybody knows anything about the Reformation? Um, Martin Luther had a, had a couple very, I guess, well-known quotes. Nothing on earth is so well-suited to make the sad merry, the merry sad, to give courage to the despairing, to make the proud humble, and to lessen envy and hate as music. And he also said, next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. And you could be saying, yeah, of course you'd bring that out, because you're into music. But, but I'm telling you, um, it's important, and it's valuable, and it's something God created, and he infused it with power that we don't understand. And he uses it in ways that we don't understand. Um, and when we gather together each and every week, every one of us are faced with a choice when we walk in here. Either I'm going to sing, or I'm not going to sing. Um, and you have your own reasons for that. We could talk about that. But... Um, you know, some of you joyfully just start singing. Other of you, it's, you'd rather take a punch in the gut than sing. You know, I see you every week. I know. You know, so, so yeah, there's plenty of people, I guess, that, that seem that it, feel that it's unimportant. Um, so we're going to talk about this a little bit. So anytime you find yourself in that position, uh, ask yourself this question. Why do I feel like I don't need to sing? Especially when so much of Scripture is telling us to sing. Um, and I will tell you, lest any of you feel that I'm just uh, trying to talk to people that I don't relate to, I am not a singer. Now you may say, <laughs> now some of you are visiting maybe, if you're visiting, we're glad to have you today. My name is Jason. I should have done that at the beginning. I took it for granted that you knew who I was. Um, but I, I don't sing naturally. That's not my personality to walk around and sing all the time. Uh, in fact, it wasn't. I mean, I sang in church occasionally, like many of you, uh, growing up. <laughs> you got it. But... Uh, it really wasn't until I was in my early 20s, I guess, until I really started singing. Um, and so a lot of these things I'm talking about today, I, I had to come face to face and deal with them as God was presenting them to me and saying, are you going to do what I said or are you going to keep giving me excuses? So, yeah, that's a while back now. <laughs> but, you know, I know there's some people that are just like that. My daughter Emma is like that. You know, as soon as the shower head goes on, she is singing. And it doesn't even have to be a real song. She's making it up. And sometimes we just sit and listen and we're like, what is she actually singing? Like, we're trying to follow the story, you know. Um, that's not me. Never has been me. Um, and, and as far as we'll talk a little bit later about the, the physical attach or, uh, physical component in all of this, and I'll tell you right now, while I'm talking about it, that's not me either. I'm a very introverted person. I'm very reserved. 
Um, and again, I know some of you may say, how can that be when we see you up on the stage every week? Well, I'll tell you because, again, you do what God feels like you're, he's telling you to do. Whether you're comfortable or not, you do it and you deal with it. <laughs> That's all I can say about it. Um, you just learn to deal with it. Um, but here, depending on the translation, um, singing is referenced over 400 times. And how many of us have heard preachers tell us over and over again, if something is repeated in Scripture, it's very important? I would say 400 times is pretty significant and important then, right? Uh, so, singing and music is one of the only things that we do here that we also see in Scripture is going to be done in heaven. And we see that in various spots through Revelation. And it's part of our being made in God's image. Uh, so, we all know Genesis teaches us that we are made in God's image, and music and singing connects on a deep emotional level. Uh, somehow, God infused it with power. We don't understand it. You know, I had some people after first service come up and tell me stories of that, um, just different people in, in different states of sickness or um, mental health even, that the only thing that they can even connect with is music. After that, they don't respond to anything. Uh, God's used it and made something with it that we truly can't actually understand, but it's there. And music can induce a full range of, range of emotions from sadness to elation, and sometimes in the same song. And that song may not even have words. You know, we, we've all seen and heard those things. Um, a child has, doesn't really even have to be taught to start bopping around to music, does it? I mean, I think our kids just started doing it. We didn't really teach them. And we also see that in Scripture in 1 Samuel with Saul. Uh, when the harmful spirit was upon him, as Scripture said, he called up David. David would come play for him, and the spirit would depart. And he would have calm and peace. So God has infused music with something. Whether we can explain it or not, it doesn't matter if we can explain it. He's done it. He uses it. He intends us to use it. And... We're told that God sings. So this kind of flies right in the face of, of all the, those who think that being stoic and detached and distant is more holy. Um, and we get that right from Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. So catch that. God will exalt over you with loud singing. So this word that is translated as exalt, it means to rejoice and to display joy. So I think like a word picture there to me is it's like a, a parent whose child just hit the game-winning home run or scored the game-winning touchdown, whatever. And I like sports, so deal with my illustration. So... Anyway, it's the parent who is ecstatic over the child. Um, the thing is, though, for us, in our situation with God, that should actually make us worship him even more because he's the one who got the victory. It was all because of him. He's the one who paid the price. He's the one who made the way. It was his triumph, not ours. And yet, when we come to him and he's rescued us and redeemed us, he's jubilant over us. It doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it works. And the fact is, that's the way his reaction is to us. Shouldn't our reaction be that to him? So, we've talked a little bit about the why. Now I want to talk a bit about the what. So what does singing do? Well, singing helps us communicate what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts as well as helps perpetuate that work. And I lump in with this one the whole fact that when we gather together and start singing, that's, that's our response to God. That's our way to bless him and minister to him. That's all lumped into this one. And in Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and singing, making melody to the Lord with your hearts, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And singing also helps us remember God's word helps us to learn, helps us to teach each other and edify each other. Uh, Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Um, 
We are to let the word of Christ dwell richly in us, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. So, again, very familiar scriptures, um, but hopefully just maybe bring a little bit different twist to them in your minds. Uh, so there's a whole scientific area of study within music. And this, I found a uh, quote from a, a gentleman, Dr. Oliver Sacks, who studies the effect of music on the human brain. And it's interesting, not that most of us don't already know this, but science is proving that children and adults, we just naturally are unable to really retain much information unless they're done with some sort of mnemonic devices or patterns. And he says the most powerful of these devices are rhyme, meter, and song. Now, I bring that up because it's, it's another one of those cases where science is basically just proving that Scripture is true. So we see that God being our designer, he intends us to use music that way because he talks about it in Deuteronomy 31, 19 through 21, where God told Moses to teach the Israelites a song so that when many evils and troubles come upon them, the song will remind them and be a witness to them of what God is doing and what God has done. Um, and I'll just tell you right now, I know, I feel like I'm kind of buzzing through this stuff, but that's because I'm trying to get you on time here, and my initial first draft of this would have had us here till about two. <laughs> so I kind of picked out the bits and pieces that I really wanted to make sure you heard, so I'm trying to fit them all in there. So I'm sorry if I'm moving a bit quick, but that's also why I gave you a lot more stuff in the insert this week. Um, so the next thing, singing is intended to express and engage our emotions. Now I know as soon as I say that, I know I lost some of you. Um, and I'm going to camp out on this one a little bit. Um, because, hey, like I said, I, I get it, I relate. Emotion is not my strong suit. Ask my wife. It's not a great thing for me. So it's something I have to learn to do, something I have to make myself do sometimes. Um, so with all this science associated to learning about music and the effects of music and singing, it's also been proven true that there is a necessary emotional component to it. And Paul references this, again, in Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, when he states there at the end of those verses, making melody to the Lord in our hearts. That's what we're talking about, in our hearts. That's the emotional aspect of this whole thing. So singing might be considered to be the logical next step um, when words just aren't enough. So we can easily uh, say a phrase, we can understand what we're saying, and still not truly get it. Um, until we put it to song and we start stretching it out, repeating it, looping it, whatever. Um, that's when the words and their meanings start actually diving down into our hearts and our souls, and like, we get it on a deeper level. You know, we just sang that song forever. I could have stood here and read you lyrics. You could have read the lyrics with me. But I would bet you that, well, I shouldn't bet because that's not right, but... <clears throat> I would almost guarantee that uh, those lyrics would not be as impactful to you unless once they're set to that, that music and that melody, now, boom, now they go right down. Now they're stuck inside. Um, and, and the beauty of it becomes much bigger and much greater. Um, you know, I also think another song example, which many of you may not know this, but I only found this out a few months ago, the song Amazing Grace, everybody know it? Everybody love it? You know that song was a flop. When it was originally written, it was not popular at all. It was very forgettable. No one used it. And it was that way for years until it was rewritten and put a different melody to it. He changed the melody to it, and now all of a sudden, it's a great song. So... There's, there's an aspect of, of that music tied with those words. It just does something. Uh, there's an emotional part of it. But here's the thing. Emotionalism is not what we're going for. What we're going for is authentic emotion. Um, and to explain this part of it, 
Uh, Bob Coughlin, in his book, True Worshippers, he explains it much better than I could explain it. So I'm just going to read you a little portion here of what he says about emotionalism versus emotion. So he says, Some Christians have been taught to repress their emotions as they sing. They've been told to fear feeling anything too strongly, and that maturity means holding back. But what we want to avoid is emotionalism, not emotions. Emotionalism pursues feelings as an end in themselves. It's wanting to feel something with no regard to how that feeling is produced or its ultimate purpose. In contrast, the emotions that singing is meant to express are a response to who God is and what he's done. Vibrant singing engages, uh, enables us to combine truth and God seamlessly with passion for God, doctrine and devotion, mind and heart. Suppressing or ignoring your feelings when you sing contradicts what singing is designed to do. Passionless singing is an oxymoron. So that statement, you know, passionless singing is an oxymoron. So, you know, let that come to mind next time we find ourselves singing through a verse and halfway through, it actually dawns on us, you know, I don't even know what I'm singing. Like, I don't even, what am I even saying? You know, the words are just kind of skimming off of our heads. We're not even thinking. So next time that happens to you, just know that's oxymoron. <laughs> but, uh, okay, sorry. That's funny. So... The singing itself, uh, that even engages, it's, it's a physical act itself. It takes more to sing than it does to talk. Um, and that may seem like a stupid point to make. However, it's very true. Um, the more that you actually have to sing, the more you realize that it engages muscles and things that you don't really even use. Uh, so there's that part of it. There's, there's that physical connection just to sing. And then in Scripture, we also see all kinds of various physical expressions associated with singing. We see kneeling, we see lifting of hands, bowing down, clapping, playing instruments, dancing, uh, standing and all is even considered to be one of those things. So the physical aspect is always present or should always be present. Um, so the question then that some may have is, well, why don't we see that more in our settings when we gather together? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Some of it, like the emotionalism thing, which I just talked about, that's a huge one. Um, if you've never gotten to those conversations with pe people before, that's a huge one that comes up. Um, there are cultural factors, just, you know, reservations and, um, you know, just different cultural things that people have been taught. Then there's the vulnerability, vulnerability, there you go. Uh, aspect of things, because you have to be okay with feeling vulnerable in front of people. And honestly, when, when people come and want to join the worship team, especially singers, that's one of the first things I tell them, is you've got to be okay with people watching you worship, and it has to be real and authentic, and if that's difficult or not comfortable, you got to deal with that, um, because we're not here to lead songs. We're here to lead worship. You can't lead worship and, and be um, protective and want to hide yourself. You can't do that. So I make sure that all the singers know that, and so we're all working on it, just so you know. But that's not just something that we need to work on. That's something that we need to work on. Um, we all have to be okay with it. Uh, we're not in any of this alone. We are the bride, the gathered church, and we worship together. Um, so we shouldn't be ashamed of worship showing, to, especially to each other. Uh, so, so then there's uh, whatever the reasons are that people have a hard time with it. There's still those then that would ask, well, why, why should that even concern us? Why do we even care? Well, I would say Old and New Testament scriptures both reference physical responses. Uh, in New Testament, we see it in Acts, 1 Corinthians, and Timothy. It seems obvious that God wants all of us, including our physical bodies, to bring him glory. And then we encourage and communicate each other through physical action all the time, whether we realize it or not. Uh, you know, it's that uh, the old rule of 80% of our communication is done non-verbally. 
that's true, whether you're outside of here or in here. Um, so in Psalm 34, I guess it's a great, another example where Scripture is actually, um, or science nowadays is backing up what Scripture already said a long time ago. Psalm 34, 5 says that those who look to the Lord are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. So have you ever thought about to yourself, does my countenance communicate the truth inside? Um, you know, if somebody were to watch and evaluate you, I think, you know, if you could ask them, what do you think they would describe to you as your countenance? Um, just another thing to think about there. Uh, so God created us relationally. We see it in friendships and marriages, everything. The closer we are to people physically, the more physical interaction there is, whether it's shaking a hand or, you know, hugging or holding hands as you're walking, whatever it is, there's always a physical component to that. Um, now, I'll also say, sometimes you just don't feel it. Anybody, anybody understand that? Everybody felt that? All right. Well, me and one guy. <laughs> so sometimes we just need to make ourselves uh, start. And, and I already can hear it. Some of you are saying, wasn't well, that hypocritical? You know, if you don't feel it, you shouldn't be doing it. Well, okay. But how many of us, even knowing that our jobs are important and necessary and something that we may even love to do, how many of you sometimes wake up in the morning and you just don't want to get up? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so the point is you get up and you start moving and you start doing it. And after your body is already moving, then your mind and your heart catch up. Sometimes our worship is the same way, because we don't always feel it, but God doesn't tell us to go off feelings. God tells us to go off truth. So we are responding to God's truth, whether we feel it or not. And then eventually, your heart and mind catches up anyway. Um, but it, and, and for anybody who thinks that that may be disingenuous, I would actually counter by saying, actually, it's those times of submission and humility and humbleness before God that are some of the, the more truer acts of worship um, because you are putting him before yourself and before your feeling. So that's my whole spiel and emotion. We'll move on from that now. So you, for those of you who feel uncomfortable can feel a little more comfortable now. So number four, it's unifying for the church. Singing is unifying for the church. So we sing together to reinforce the expression and unity of the church. And by singing together, we're joining in and reaffirming, proclaiming the work of Christ, not only each individual, but the body, the, the bride of Christ. So what this means is every single one of your voices are important. So there isn't anybody who can say, well, I don't really sing that well. And that person over there, they sing really great, so I'll let them sing and they can kind of carry my load. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, God doesn't look at us that way. He still expects every voice that he's handed out to be returning to him. The praise that he's given, or the ability for praise that he's given. Now, some people, I get it, some people have physical inabilities they can't sing. That's fine. You worship however you can do it, and that will be completely acceptable at that point. Um, and Paul references, um, well, I'll step back here a second. The fact that every voice matters and the fact that we're doing it as a unifying action in the church also, that also means that style doesn't matter anymore. So when Paul references the hymns, the songs, the spiritual songs, that's basically saying different various styles and forms. And it's been said before that, you know, years ago, hundreds of years back, they were singing songs that we would not recognize. We wouldn't know how to sing them. And I guarantee you, if time tarries hundreds of years from now, they're going to be singing songs that we don't recognize. Um, it doesn't matter at all. It's a Philippians 2, 3 thing where it comes into play that do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourself. And have you ever thought about it? You know, I mentioned before, you know, we, well, someday we get to heaven, we get to see Jesus face to face. Have you ever thought also, Scripture talks about the choirs that will be singing in heaven, the songs that they'll be singing. 
So you think about people from all of time, all nations, all tribes, ever, all in one place singing. What kind of song style do you think they're going to be using? You think it's going to be one that we recognize? Or if it's one we recognize, who, well, how many people there are not going to recognize it? So, point being, it's kind of a comical way to look at it. Point being, I don't think it's going to matter to us at all. Because the style is not the important part of it. It's the content, the, the common focus, it's the one being worshipped, that's the important part. Um, so, all of this, to a true worshipper, style means nothing. It doesn't matter. It's complete preference, but it doesn't hinder or stop anything. So I kind of buzzed through all that, but I think I've got you on time. So here, in conclusion, I think we all need to learn that singing is a gift that is expected to be used. And we need to look at it and learn from David, who was called a man after God's own heart, that in all circumstances we lift our voices to God. We can see throughout his life all the different things he went through, pain, joy, victory, defeat, whatever. He was always still singing. Even when he was lamenting, he was not forgetting who God was. And he was still raising his voice. So through all those circumstances, we should be singing. And God sings, so, so should we. And if you want to turn that into a declaration, God sings, so shall I. Uh, so from f- moving forward, um, I just would hope that then we can have our days be punctuated and our gatherings be punctuated with a mindset um, from, from earlier on that, that quote, the mindset that says our great end is to be found numbered among the worshipers of God and the, understand the gift, the privilege, and the responsibility we have to sing praises to a most worthy Lord.